the Digital Leaders Podcast, Episode 2, Sherry Kutu. Technology is changing the way we connect, learn, and do business. On this season of the Digital Leaders Podcast, we sit down with some of the UK's most influential thought leaders in government, enterprise, and entrepreneurship to learn more about what they are doing to digitally transform themselves and the organizations they lead, why it matters, and what we can do as listeners to build our own prosperous, digitally enabled, and connected communities. The time is now. The place is the Digital Leaders Podcast, and the future is digital. Hi, guys, and welcome to episode two of the Digital Leaders Podcast. My name is Tara Ferguson. I am the founder of the podcast production studio, SBT Digital. And on today's show, I'm super excited to introduce you to a wonder woman in her own right. Really, she is. Sherry Kutu, CBE, executive chair and founder of Founders for Schools, a free online platform connecting educators and students with business leaders to help solve the private sector's biggest challenge, a lack of talent. Born and raised in Vancouver, Canada, Sherry graduated from UBC with her BA before making her way to the UK, where she received a master's in economics from the London School of Economics. A natural entrepreneur and problem solver, she furthered her education at Harvard's prestigious business school. She founded her second company, Interactive Investor, in 1994, sold it in 2001, and currently sits on the board of Zoopla and the London Stock Exchange. On today's show, Sherry shares why she transitioned from a future in psychology to computer science, why she believes that role models and work experience is critical for career development, and what things parents and educators can do right now to help cultivate a skilled, digitally savvy workforce in the UK. So with that, please welcome Sherry Kutu. Hello. (laughs) Thanks very much for having me. So Sherry, I love the concept of Founders for Schools and much like yourself, I'm a huge advocate of role models and the impact that they have on people. So I wanted to ask you, who were some of your role models growing up when you were younger? I think my biggest role model, and this wasn't until I was a little bit older, was Steve Shirley, who now is known as Dame Stephanie Shirley. And you may or may not know her. She uh, started up a computer business and it employed women who worked from home um, when their kids were in school. And it was one of the case studies we studied when I was at the London School of Economics. And I was really inspired by it. And that, I guess, allowed me to entertain two ideas that I hadn't thought of before. One was that women could actually lead their own business. And it definitely hadn't occurred to me that one could before then. Um, And also that many women who loved what they did for work could also do that between the school runs. So you could be a mom and you could have a meaningful career. And that was invisible to me when I was a young person. I I didn't have that view and my family didn't have that view. It was, well, there's big companies and, you know, you you have to get a job um, because you don't want to be on the dole. That's really unpleasant. Right. Well, because you grew up in a relatively, did you grow up in a small part of um, BC? I did. I grew up in Prince George, which is right. a, a lumber a lumber town uh, right. about 500 miles north of Vancouver that has just over 75 frost-free days a year, um, which isn't that many. Um, uh, uh, you know, and and neither of my parents went to, went to university, so that was really helpful to me. And then a, a little bit later, when I was CEO of my own company and thinking about um, sort of having children. One of my friends who was a lawyer and one of the non-exec directors on my company had kids a couple of years before me. And they, although they were peers, became my role models because they were juggling work and family at the same time. And I could suddenly see how they could do it. Whereas in my sort of family and growing up, women didn't juggle work and, uh, and family. They sort of stopped for a break. And that was really, that was really helpful for, for me. No, for sure. And I think you're not alone in that because I think that it wasn't very common at the time to see necessarily women, let's be honest, probably running or owning their own businesses and running it and working from home or working while they had children. It was sort of like a one or the other. So, um, yeah, exactly. And, and that was, that was, again, it was just brilliant for me because it was like, ah, oh, I, 
think I, I think that sounds good to me. It was, you know, it felt really comfortable and, and natural. So, um, you know, I sort of tried it out and I've been doing it ever since. And it, uh, it indeed, it's fantastic. The other thing is that they loved what they did. And I now absolutely love what I do, but I do know some people who have chosen a slightly different path and they don't really like what they, they do very much, but they do it because they sort of started down that pathway. And so for me, life as an entrepreneur and, um, and I guess now philanthropist just gives me a lot of options that I didn't necessarily think that I would have because of the environment that I grew up with in my own family. For sure. And I think one of the things that you're doing with Founders for Schools is you're educating the next generation about the options that they have as well, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and that's more important now than ever because the, the world is more global and is restructuring really quickly. And the, you know, when I graduated, you know, it was probably not uncommon for somebody to take a job and stay in that job for decades. Whereas one of the things that I know through, uh, I guess, through my work at LinkedIn is that, uh, you know, on average, people now have 25 identifiable jobs between school and retiring and six or seven different uh, identifiable career streams. And so the need to continually educate ourselves as we get you know, older and older, because, um, you know, the jobs are changing and the industries that we're working in is changing, uh, it, you know, it's just accelerated. So the role model piece and looking at people a few years down the road from you allows you to see pathways when otherwise you might feel fear or <laughs> perhaps despair rather than excitement about what is next around the corner. For sure, for sure. And so now you mentioned LinkedIn, and I know with Founders for Schools, for example, one of the components is a work finder component, and you built that with LinkedIn, a company called Edubase, and a company called Doodle. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's that's absolutely correct. Work finder is an extension of Founders oh. for Schools, which takes the same business leaders, and instead of saying, will you go visit a class, it's say, will you host this child or these children at work so they can you know shadow you or get get experience of a workplace for you know one three five days maybe maybe two weeks um, and they're both necessary because if you're sort of six to 16 then you need to understand what's out there work wise but you're probably not yet ready to do a project or make a meaningful contribution um, or not as meaningful as otherwise but when you're right. 16 you really start to weigh up and, and everybody's asking you 24 hours a day, what are you going to do when you grow up? You know, what are you thinking? <laughs> Where? Um, and it gets harder and harder to answer that, particularly if, if you don't, um, if you haven't ever been in a workplace. So we thought, wouldn't it be neat if the, if the business leaders, you know, the people who are running companies or working in companies say, I'd be really happy to host a couple students every year or maybe a couple times a year so that they can work on a project with me. And in working with that project, they can also understand a little bit about you know, why I love my job and why it's possible for them to love their job. And that's so important. I think that exposure is so important and getting that hands-on experience is different so much so than reading about it in a book. Yeah, and there's a huge amount of research to show that as well. If you look at um, what changes behavior or impacts uh, student attainment, watching, you know, The Apprentice of Dragon's Den or reading a book doesn't change their behavior. But when they actually meet them in you know in the flesh and they go into a workplace it suddenly becomes very real and and then they feel empowered to take their take their own decisions and sometimes um, it could be that your parent may bring you into their office or or something like that but there are many students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds where the parents aren't able to to take them you know into their work so sometimes kids graduate and they've never been in, in a modern workplace or they've only ever been in their parents' workplace, which may not be representative of the sort of thing that they might want to do. So I see it you know, really as an obligation of the, you know, the education sector to make sure that they've got you know, a good number of hours of experience of the, the future of work. Um, and that means we really need to turn to the small and medium-sized businesses in every community and have them commit to and pledge to opening up their doors so that they can still recruit in a few years' time when they need to hire someone. Um, I think if right. you don't do that, you can't really complain about not having people with the right skills if you don't give them a taste of, uh, of what sort of skills they might need if they were to work at a company like yours. So it takes all of us to make, uh, you know, to, make, to make that work. Right, right. And do you think that so oftentimes when you're working in those more digital adoptive industries, 
you lose sight of the fact that a lot of other people might not have had exposure to the same sort of opportunity. So you forget that the next generation, not everybody has a laptop on them 24 seven or that sort of thing. You think? I think, I think you can get into a little bubble and think that everybody's like you. I think it's kind of a, a, a sad facet of human nature, um, but it is true. But, and you know, some children may not be able to afford a computer or their parents might, might not be able to afford a computer, but most people have phones. So, right. um, so that's one of the reasons why we made our, our work finder app um, available on phones for students so that on the, on the device that they're carrying around in their, in their pocket, they can um, they can sort of use it as an extra tool. So instead of playing a game, they can uh, they can play Work Finder and find a you know find a placement at a at a company near them. And I love that. It is it's great. In 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 some countries, it's really hard to find the small and medium sized businesses because there's not uh, the government isn't as open with their information. But every private company in the UK, uh, you can you can find them online. So it was really easy for us to to create a tool that made what in other countries is invisible, visible for the UK population, which is, um, which is brilliant. I would recommend it to all governments everywhere, but, the, but congratulations to the UK government for making that possible to, to do. And so when you approach businesses to be a part of this, are they really keen to get involved? Do they see the value of how it will eventually help them and you know, the country going forward? Absolutely. 93% of small and medium sized businesses think that their, their hardest thing they do is attracting talent. So if there's a chance that this young person who they might have a, you know, in, their, in their office for work experience might want to work for them, then that's, that's manna from heaven. So there's a little bit of, you know, or quite a lot of self-interest in that they need to hire people if they're the sorts of companies that you find on, on our, our database. Um, and you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, in addition to that, they're all members of their community. They probably felt when they were in school themselves that they didn't really know what they wanted to do when they, when they grew up. Because to be perfectly frank, I don't think any of us, knew, I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do when right. I grew up. And I, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> Good, um, same as me. I feel better now. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but, but those of us who in business off, often didn't intend to, it's not what we plan to do from the age of five, probably because we're not lawyers or doctors or, um, you know, or, or teachers, which I think you can want to do from the very early age. Um, but most business leaders, A, are members of their community and B, remember what it was like when they were that age. And, you know, when you ask them the question, you know, surely you can come up with a project that that somebody who's you know, 16, 17, 18 can work on for you for a week or two or right. a couple of days. You can do that, can't you? Yeah. And you know, yeah. I, you know, could you not think up a project for somebody for a couple of days? You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, we all have lurking projects that we would like to do. And this is an opportunity to, to get it done and to change someone's life at the same time. I love that. And then I guess my other question is like, so you've lived and worked in numerous other countries and I was wondering what can the UK learn from other countries when it comes to programs and services that foster technology adoption for you? Um, I think there are other countries doing really interesting things. Estonia, for instance, does computer programming and maths, I think from the age of four. And um, that's really very exciting. Now, part of that was sparked off by Skype being a role model of, you know, hey, look at you can change the world by creating a neat company like Skype. If I look to Singapore, I'm really impressed by what they do at the universities. So they guarantee to students that they will get work experience with scale-ups while they are studying there. That's part of studying. So they don't just say, you're going to sit in a classroom and learn. They say, you're going to sit in a classroom and learn, and you're going to have work experience at, a, you know, at an innovation company. And some universities go further than that and, and guarantee young people uh, you know, sort of a term abroad. And I think if you think of, you know, what the role of universities is to open up people's minds and also to contribute to their community, universities that make sure that in order to get your degree certificate, you get work experience in order to graduate. I think that's the way of the future. And one of the things I really like about, and this is, um, again, sort of in, in Singapore, ensuring that you need to have a term abroad also means that when they come back, they're going to be able to expand the business internationally and also be culturally sensitive because they've lived somewhere else. Right. And in this world of protectionism that we seem to be going down, I think that's a great role that universities can, um, can lead with. 
uh, in the UK with technology, I think there's some really great things going on. So you've got Raspberry Pi, you've got Apps for Good, you've got Code Club, uh, and you've got the BBC Microbit, all of which encourage children at a young age to make things. And I think that exploration and making of things where you're kind of testing hypotheses, you know, you try it, it doesn't work, but you learn, hey, I tried it, it doesn't work, that's not the end of the world, I'll just pick myself up and try another thing and test another hypothesis. Yeah. And I think that's an important um, thing that, that schools and universities and communities can, uh, can help everybody with. And I, that's what a, one of the things I really like about Founders for Schools is you're sort of taking the model that universities are starting to take, which is now every degree has some sort of work placement to give people that, that work exposure. You're doing the same thing, but saying, hey, it doesn't have to start when they're 19 years old. Let's start this exposure at, you know, I think your program starts at 6 to 18, correct? Uh, absolutely. And you, they, they have formed their views of what they're going to do very early on. So if you, if you wait until they're 19, your pipeline will be very contracted. So we want as wide a pipeline as possible who, um, who might want to enter into further education or, or vocational education. So starting at, uh, again, the research shows that as early as eight, um, children have formed their views about what they might want to do, um, but those are not based on experience of workplaces. So if we open up our workplaces to them at a younger age, maybe it's a workplace visit, maybe it's a couple of hours of just you know opening up your your shop and saying, hey, come and watch me work, you know, when they're young. That's right. a good thing. It opens up their minds. 80% of teachers think it's the single most impactful thing that you can do to a young person, not with their employability, but with their, their attainment. So it's known to boost their understanding of what their role in the world is and to get them better grades, which is incredible. It, it doesn't cost anything to go visit a business that's a couple of miles away from the school. So I want to know for any you know, parents or educators that aren't using Founders for Schools, what can they do to sort of help their children or cultivate a skilled, digitally savvy workforce in the UK? Uh, well, I think obviously the best thing for them to do would be to use Founders for Schools. It's a free resource that's there for them to use. Um, and it's as easy as using as Google or Amazon. If they can use Amazon to buy a book, they can use Founders for Schools to, uh, instead of ordering a book into their classroom, to request a business leader to come and visit their classroom. That, the model that we had was it should be as easy to get a business leader into your into your classroom as it is to get a book into your home using Amazon. So they can do that right now. It's super simple. If the children are 16 to 18, then they, I would recommend them putting the, the, the child in the driver's seat and, and telling them about WorkFinder and suggesting that they download the app um, and that they start to explore the really cool businesses that are all around them that um, otherwise they wouldn't necessarily be able to see. It's like giving them magic spectacles by, um, by using our app. And is the app free or is there a cost to it? The app is entirely free to download and entirely, entirely free to look at all the really cool companies. And I think that's really important from a social mobility point of view. Agreed. Agreed. And I think even just, even just the opportunity to look at these different companies, companies that when they were younger, they had never heard of because that's the way that the workforce is evolving these days. It's just a really, really good exposure, you know? Yeah. Did you know that 100% of the net new jobs in the UK are from companies that didn't exist five years ago? A hundred percent of the net new jobs are from small companies that didn't exist five years ago. That's how fast and how dynamic our economy is and why it's very dangerous to, to go on out of date data sources when you're thinking about recommending businesses to visit or for your, kid, your, your child to, to think about having work experience on. And the other, the other thing is that in, in traditional large companies that may be shrinking, the job satisfaction is known to be very, very low, like you know, just over 50%. But if you look at innovation companies and the fast growing small ones, job satisfaction is in the 90s. They love what they do and they get real meaning from their, from their work because they're, well, they're smaller and they can see the impact of what they do. And I think that's important as a parent that you'd want your child to be in a workplace where um, people liked what they did. Um, and it's, you know, there's a lot of research to show that people don't necessarily like what they do if they're, if they've chosen a big company that maybe isn't that innovative. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And you spend a lot, often spend a lot of time working. So you definitely want to enjoy it. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I certainly, yeah, yes, I think enjoying <laughs> your work is really important for all of us. Uh, now, I know you launched Digital Leaders Week last year with Minister Matt Hancock at the London Stock Exchange. And yes. I wanted to know, in your opinion, how can government and large corporations leverage organizations like Digital Leaders to build and foster future digital talent in the UK? Well, uh, clearly by providing work experience with their, <laughs> with their members. Um, I think it's really critical. For, so, so if I talk about WorkFinder, we use AI and machine learning to recommend to students. Um, so maybe they chose a tiny company first that has you know, 10 or 20 people in it. Um, if they've had one tiny company, then we're going to recommend that they consider a large company so that they can experience a large company. And if they've had one small company and one large company, we're then going to recommend a medium-sized company and probably in a different industry. So I think by making their uh, and encouraging their employees to volunteer to host work experience at, at, their, work, at their workplaces, they can make an enormous difference. Many corporations give five days um, volunteer, you know, encourage their employees to take either two days or one day or five days of, of volunteering in, in the year, and they encourage them to do that. Well, I think we should redefine volunteering and say you don't have to leave the office to volunteer. You don't have to go paint a fence somewhere. You could host young children from your community in your office for, you know, for a couple of days, for a week, and that makes a huge difference. Probably the biggest difference that we can make given the tectonic plates of, you know, industry have changed so quickly. The teachers really need our help and the government really needs our help. Right. Um, you know the, the movie Dunkirk. Have you, seen, have you seen that movie? I haven't yet, but I, I okay. know it's phenomenal. I, I heard okay. it's a tearjerker, actually. It's, it's a tearjerker, but there's this one scene that... Um, uh, in it, and again, Dunkirk is about a real situation. So it was about Dunkirk, as you've got. There's one scene where all of this, there's like 300,000 soldiers who are on the the beach at Dunkirk, and right. um, historically, the the big military ships kept on getting um, bombed. That they were being sent over to collect these 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 soldiers that yes. were perishing on the beach, and, and they couldn't get in, right? Because it was they too shallow. They, they no, well, they, it was too shallow. But the the opposing army and uh, an air force were bombing the big ships, oh, but right. they wouldn't. But they wouldn't bomb the little the little pleasure craft. So what what the government did was they said they they appealed to the owners of small and medium sized pleasure craft to go across the English Channel and to pick up as many soldiers they could from the beach. And yeah. they picked up every last soldier from the beach. Yeah. And to my mind, the students who are in classes right now who have never had work experience are on the beach. And if, if we're a small or medium sized business or a large business open up our businesses for you know a couple days for every child then we will change the culture in months and there's no other way to to affect this cultural change that uh, that, that we really need to do so what i'd say to the digital leaders is if you're doing digital stuff then you have an obligation to redefine the volunteering of the, of your workforce and encourage them to uh, to, to register on WorkFinder and you know, or anything, you know, or any other service. To be perfectly frank, but it's very easy on WorkFinder, so that kids can find them and can get the experience in the digital industries that they that they need, that we all need them to have, and that they need them to have. I like that. I also like. So I am familiar with the Dunkirk story, and uh, I like that reference. It's not a soft reference. It's a pretty, you know, like when you say like we need to help these children the same way that the soldiers were literally rescued from. But we do. We do. Mm -hmm. There's a million job openings. There was one million two hundred job openings in the UK. Ninety three percent of these business leaders are saying that the number one problem, they can't even accept a customer order because they can't hire people fast enough. And at the same time, you've got over half a million people who are unemployed because they don't have the right skill sets. So if right. taking a bit of time in a digitally enabled company will allow them to understand what they need and to get the experience that they need to, 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 to put them on a different path, then that's amazing. And we can't expect the schools to do that on their own. We can't expect the universities to do it on their own. We're all members of the community and we can only make it happen together. And it is as stark as having soldiers on a beach perishing. These are <laughs> it's 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 as stark, if not more stark than that. Um, this is an entire generation that's being left behind. Yeah, very true. So you talked about Founders for Schools as a solution to the growing lack of talent. And I wanted to ask you, what has to take place for you to feel like satisfied that you have achieved the goals that you set out to achieve with Founders for Schools? 
well, I think the skills crisis that our country is facing would need to have been solved. Um, that would make me feel very satisfied. Um, so when no companies are complaining about the skills crisis and they're able to find the flow of talent that they want in the UK, I shall be very satisfied. Um, but that's quite a tall order. There's 1.1 million children who are 16, 17, 18 in the UK. Um, and at the moment, 93% of businesses are very concerned as their number one issue is skills. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a tall order, but it's, it's, it's worth doing. Um, but it will take, uh, as they say, it will take a village to, to, to make these changes. And we can't look to the government or the teachers. I think we have to look to ourselves and think, what can we do? What's the project that I can offer someone this quarter who may be 16 or 17 and wondering about what they might do um, in, a, in a few years time? I like that. I like that. Giving listeners an opportunity to also be a part of the change as well. Okay, last question. I want to know what drives you to continue to do what you do for youth and the next generation? Ooh, it's something that needs to be, it's really important. And I can't actually understand why this solution isn't really obvious to others. But maybe it's that my background is in technology. I mean, I'm using, you know, the, the platform that we put together is really borrowing ideas from LinkedIn and from Zoopla and from Love Film and um, the technology industries, it kind of floors me that it, it's not already being used in education because it's such an obvious, it's, to me, it's such an obvious solution that, that just improves everybody's position. And what drives me, I guess, is to a certain extent, the, the teachers that are telling us that their lives are significantly improved and they're able to do things that they've wanted to do for years way, way easier and way faster. And when you see the kids' eyes light up, that's just amazing. So there's, there's nothing like seeing the change and the impact on the people um, uh, who are using your service that you know, makes you not want to go to sleep because uh, you're so excited about what you're doing and makes you wake up early with a, with a spring in your step because you can help more people. That's, um, that's, to me, it's really fulfilling. Uh, if, if they didn't like it and it wasn't changing and having a really big Im Im impact, then I probably wouldn't, that wouldn't be driving for me. But the, the fact that it's solving the, the biggest problem of our, of our generation, and it seems to be solving it quickly and you know, pretty easily for those who adopt it, is um, it fills you with enthusiasm every single day. Um, and that, you know, I would only wish that feeling the impact of one's actions in such a strong way on, on anybody, because uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to feel that pull and to know that what you do every day seems to make a difference. For sure. Are you guys hiring? <laughs> I'm just yes, joking. I want to be a part of hiring. I want to be a part of organization. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's really, I really like, I love that. That's awesome because, you know, it's such a, it's so huge and the impact will be immense. Okay, so now we're going to go into our lightning round. And how this works is I ask a question and you're going to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. So here we go. The one book I would recommend to all listeners and why is? Ooh, I like Atlas Shrugged um, because it's about entrepreneurship and inventing the world and overcoming barriers that are placed in front of you. The one person I would like to have lunch with is? Possibly Melinda Gates. I like her approach to philanthropy and, and I like the data and evidence driven manner in which she goes about solving very big problems. And I find that inspiring. One thing people would be surprised to learn about me is? Hmm. I don't know. I feel like I'm sort of out there. Uh, that I'm shy. I think that would be surprising for people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I am shy. And the advice I would give my 15-year-old self would be? Try everything and have uh, an objective of loving what you do and don't be afraid awesome okay is there anything else you want to share with our listeners uh no i'm uh, i'm really excited that you wanted to wanted to ask me some questions and i hope if they're wondering if they should do something they feel more emboldened to uh to go out and do it and if there's anything that i can do to help them let me know on twitter it's askutu all right, that is it for episode two of the Digital Leaders Podcast. 
Now, if you or your organization wants to get involved with Founders for Schools, you can reach out to Sherry on Twitter, like she said, find her at SKUTU, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at DigiLeaders, and we will make sure to put you in touch. And if you want to find out more about Sherry and Founders for Schools, head on over to our website, digileaders.com, and click the podcast tab, and we will have more information there. Next week, we sit down with former UK Prime Minister and Executive Chairman of the Institute for Global Change, Tony Blair, to discuss a paper his organization published in November 2017 entitled Technology for the Many and why he believes government needs to invest in technology now more than ever. It's a good one, so make sure you are subscribed via iTunes so you do not miss it. That is it for this week's episode of the Digital Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Tara Ferguson. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back next week with another episode of the Digital Leaders Podcast.